All right, welcoming you to our March Educate and Empower webinar. We have a really, really special time plans for you. It's going to be more of an experience than it is a learning and doing like we have been um, facilitating. It's cultivating inner well-being through writing, movement, and meditation. And it's especially for those who are managing Waldenstroms. But if you're somebody who does not have Waldenstroms, you will get a lot out of this too, I'm pretty sure. My name is Anne. I'm, I'm the IWMF's Wellness Program Coordinator. And I'm really thrilled that um, our guest today, Kimberly Snow, we've been collaborating for months now to bring you this very special offering. Um, she was diagnosed with Wallenstrom's in 2012, but that's not the thing I love about her most. The thing I love about her most is just her sense of humor and her blistering intelligence that's obvious from the moment she opens her mouth. Um, but she is a PhD, she's a teacher, she's an author, she's a workshop leader, and she, um, yeah, she's done, the, she's done the work of, you know, like going to the cave and retreating um, to meditate. She's, she's worked at a Tibetan retreat center in Northern Carolina, uh, California for six years, and she's written five books, including this beautiful book, Writing Yourself Awake, meditation and creativity. So um, a lot of the things in this book are things that we're going to be exploring with her today. Um, and she is going to be sharing a lot of resources with us as well to help us start and sustain a regular meditation and writing practice. So how this is going to work is there's going to be some back and forth between Kimberly and I um, with me providing some movement breaks and some sounds meditation breaks and she will be doing the rest. Um, and we'll have a short question and answer period at the end. So type your questions into the chat as we go along and please stay muted. And thank you so much to the IWMF staff who is here helping out today. Shelly, we um, really appreciate your presence and love to see all of your faces from all over the world joining us. And thank you so much for doing this, Kimberly. I really appreciate you spending time with us today and I can't wait to learn from you. Well, I'm really happy to be here and I, I want to thank, thank Anne for being so patient. We ch I changed the name of the webinar about six times and every time I'd send it to Anne, she'd say, oh, that's great, we'll go with that. And the next time it'd be the same thing. And of course we ended up with the original title but Anne was very patient through the whole thing. And also I was talking to her the other day and I was telling her how much material I wanted to cover and you know what I wanted to say. And she says, well, how long will that take? And I said, well, about two and a half days. And she, <laughs> she didn't even flinch. She didn't even flinch. And she said, well, well, you know, I think maybe what we can do is have a PDF and just put everything you want in the PDF. And so that's what we did. And so you'll have a PDF available that has a lot of the things in it that um, I just have to, you know, I can hit the tops of it, but not go into the whole thing. So we're talking about wellness and the inner, inner being. And everybody has an inner being. You know, sometimes you'll wake up uh, oh, an inner being that's really working for you and you'll just wake up and you just feel good. You're happy for no reason whatsoever. You just feel at home in your body. You feel like you, you that everything's all right, that nobody's against you. You don't have to hurry. It's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And then the phone rings. And then the kids wake up and then the office starts trying to get in touch with you. And so you're pulled out of your inner self into an outer self. And in this culture that we're living in, especially in these days where everything is going way over its own speed limit. I mean, we're just hurtling along, you know, that, that it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> that it, it tends to pull you out into the world. It tends to <clears throat> pull you away from being into knowing, into, into doing rather than 
just staying there into, you know, knowledge rather than wisdom. So there's a lot of things in our culture that are just really designed to keep us on the on the fast track. And the inner being fades into the background. You never lose it. It's always there. <coughs> but sometimes you have to sort of find something that will help you get back to it and meditation is one way to do it writing is one way to do it and of course there are a lot there's a walk in the forest right now it looks like i'm in a forest because i have a really you know foresty kind of a background but i'm sitting at my desk but you can sit at your desk and think about nature you can look at your plants you can look at the 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 patterns that nature makes and all of the things in your room you can listen to music, you can call up a friend. There are just so many things that you can do, but you have to do them. That's the problem. And it's not only that you have to do them, you have to remember to do them. So what meditation teaches you to do, it actually gives you a choice that you can change what you're thinking and think something else. So it's like your mind has these ruts in it. Even the... the uh, uh, the doctors talk about ruts in your mind, even though they know it's like, you know, masses of uh, other stuff in there. They're not really ruts, but they're habits. That's why the, the Buddhists call them habits. And so you have these habits that create these patterns where you keep going down that road, you keep going down that road, and you begin to you know, fixate on something or to get really uh, attached to it and you can't get out. So there are different ways to deal with the, uh, we call it the monkey mind. We'll talk about that later. But right now, before we get into too much about meditation, I want you all to take do a writing thing. Uh, write on a piece of paper or on your computer. It doesn't make any difference. But I want you to set your intention for this class, for this webinar. What do you want to get out of it? Why are you here? I've always liked to start all of the workshops I do with that. Makes you more engaged in what's happening with you. I'll just do two bells. Okay. Okay, give you another second or two. So meditation is easy. You're always meditating on something. You know, meditation just means becoming familiar with. And so if you can breathe, you can meditate. And that's as, it's as simple as that. But you can breathe with intention or you can just let your, or, and you can let your mind wander. There's nothing wrong with a wandering mind, except at some point you need to do something with it. You need to control it a little bit. And it's so unfortunate that in the West, we're not trained to do that. You know, we train our dogs, we train our puppies, we train our vines to grow a certain way, but we don't go into how the mind works and what you can do about it. And so this is the main thing we'll cover today. And in, for, for, in terms of mind tension, what I want everybody to do is come away with a sense of agency that you're in charge of your inner well-being, you're in charge of your own meditation, you're in charge of whether you want to live a life that's stable or how. You know, if you, it, but you're in charge. I looked online the other day and there were so many people saying so many things and it was like, if only you follow my uh, protocol, you're going to be so happy. 
And it doesn't work that way. It does for a little while, but then unless you're engaged with your body, unless you're engaged with your emotions, unless you're engaged with your sense of yourself, it's going to fall away. You know, it'll give you a couple of weeks of something fun to do, but in the end, you have to make it your own. So that's what it really, it took me a long time to figure that out. But um, I finally did, and I, I'm, I, have, I have gone through a lot of different meditations in my life because I lived in a retreat center for so long. And when you're living in a, a, a Buddhist is one thing, Vajrayana, which is Tibetan Buddhist, is another. So with Vajrayana Buddhism, is you don't go A, B, C, D, you go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And it's really so much to learn at one time because you can't understand B until you understand G and you can't understand F until you've done blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. So it's better to take it very, very slow, take meditation very slow. Don't try to do 20 minutes. If you've never meditated before, don't try to do 20 minutes at a time. Do two minutes at a time. Do five minutes at a time. And gradually, you, you get, you make friends with yourself. You make friends with your mind. So what I want to do now is to jump right in to do three different medita meditation uh, exercises, okay? And before we do, take three deep breaths. And I'll be using the gong, and when the three gong, it begins a meditation. One gong is you go from one meditation to another, and three gongs, it's at the end. Okay, so this one, let's start. And you're going to start with doing deep breaths, and you want to do long, slow, deep breaths. And that, that, that actually, it's, it's LSD, is this, you know, if you do the, the alphabet on that. So it's long, slow, and deep. I didn't make that up. Somebody else did, but I'll never forget it. It's like really, really easy to remember. Okay. So long, slow, deep breaths. If you want to do a belly breath, well, no, let's do a belly breath later. But any kind of time you want to uh, slow down, do it at your own speed. Now you take three focus breaths. Let's just start it with three breaths, just any kind of breath you want to do. Feel the sensations in your body. Just do a quick body scan, the, the area of tension. Don't grab onto it. If it is, just let it go. Just note it. Just pay attention to it. Okay, now we're going to do the belly breath. And the belly breath is called... Uh, <coughs> just you, we'll, For now, we'll just call it uh, belly breath. All right. So you take a, a deep breath and you let your abdomen uh, expand, all right? And then you do a longer exhale out of your mouth. So we'll do three of those. Alright. 
Take another, just, just sit there for a minute, don't do anything. Now take three more deep breaths, concentrating on your heart area. Just let your attention go to your heart area. And remember somebody or something that you love, past or present. It can be a pet. It can be anything that you've loved. It can be a place. But just feel the warmth in your heart <clears throat> as you breathe. So breathe three breathing, three LSD breaths, concentrating on something you love. Just pause for a minute, let that sink in. Now sit up straight. We'll take three more deep breaths. And this time, as you breathe in, be conscious of your upper body and your lungs expand and contract. As you inhale, say to yourself, I know I am breathing. When you exhale, you say to yourself, I know that I'm breathing out. All right? Let's do three of those. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. I know I'm exhaling. I know I'm inhaling. I know I'm exhaling. Okay, these are three very simple um, exercises, but they all have a different motivation and a different outcome. The first one, where you just sit there and breathe deeply, you're relaxing the body. And it, the autonomic nerv nervous system has, you know, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic, and I can remember this because sympathetic, it starts with an S and stomach starts with an S. So the sympathetic is the, the part of your autonomic nervous system that's automatic, except for one function and that's your breathing. So you can, you can control your breathing. It'll breathe without you if you don't even try, but that's the one thing you can do and that helps the parasympathetic. And parasympathetic, remember that because somebody else said it starts with, the, with, with a prayer. It starts with peace. It's the one who keeps your body in homostasis. So if you're breathing deeply like this, you're, uh, you're saying your sympathetic system is saying to your parasympathetic system, you don't have to go into fight or flight. Everything's fine. There's no woolly mammoth chasing you. There's no, you know, uh, car salesman trying to do something ugly to you. You haven't hit anybody. So this is a way, it's just a very, very simple thing, but it's profound. And you can use it anytime you want to. 
and there are different ways where you can trigger yourself to, you know, remind yourself to do it because it's not the doing that is the problem, it's remembering to do the doing, okay? So that's the first one, it's just simply to relax. And the second one is, you, is it has to do with awareness and you are being aware of something and so what you're being aware of is love and kindness and something very positive that has to do with your life so this is a very good one to do when you get into these uh kind of dark loops that are possible all right and then the third one has to do with uniting your moving mind with awareness and we'll get into moving mind and all of that in a little bit so what it does is instead of you get into a combination of uh, focus and breathing and that's called shamatha or calm abiding meditation okay Everybody with me? All right, that's good. So one way that I found really, really helpful to remind myself to go into a different mode is to do a mantra. Now, in Hinduism and Buddhism, they have a long, long history of using a mantra that's connected with the sacred sound. And the sacred sound is connected to prayers, it's connected to this, it's connected to that. That's not the kind of mantra I'm talking about. And this was actually, I learned this from a Tibetan uh, uh, Rinpoche, Sogni Rinpoche, and he told the story that he was trying to cross this bridge in between two big buildings, in some place in the east, I'm not sure where, but it was a glass bridge and everybody was going across and nobody was falling down, but he was like 10, 20, 30 stories up, up, up high. And he started across and he froze. He just totally froze. And he, he didn't know what to do. And so he, he and of course, he had his entourage with him and they were kind of pushing him out. And so he thought, well, no, I'll, I'll, say, a, I'll, I'll say a mantra, I'll say a prayer. He started out again and he froze. And then the same thing happened again. He said, well, let me just think about this bit. Everybody just wait just a minute. I'll think, you know, I was, when I was in Nepal as a child, I fell off a tree. It scared me. I didn't like heights. Oh, I was flying into Bhutan one time in a helicopter and it almost hit the side of the wall. And so I said, I'm now, I'm fine. I can go across. So he starts across again and he froze. And then he just took a deep breath and he closed his eyes and this, this um, phrase popped into his mind. And it was, it feels real, it feels real, but it's not. It feels real, but it's not real. Feels, and so he made a mantra on the spot there. It's real, but not true. It feels real, but it's not true. It feels real. And then he was able to go across the, uh, the, the bridge. And so he told us, I was in a, a retreat with him at the time, and he told us his story, and he says, now everybody make up their own mantra. And so since then, I've been doing the same thing, and that's what I want you to do, is make up your own mantra. And so some of the ones that I've used in the past, well, the one I use the most is don't say it. Uh, just don't, don't say that. Don't say it. And you can use a tone of voice, you know, with that. Use a little bit of a, uh, a song, Let It Be. Um, the sun's still there, no matter what the weather's doing. That's a little bit long for a mantra, so try to do it. And try to think of a situation that you would, you know, sort of get yourself into and it'd be good to get it out of. Like, don't say it. Another one, and I discovered this very by accident, is to sing happy birthday to yourself three times. 
And the reason I got that one was a friend of mine called up from San Francisco and she says, oh, Kimberly, what am I going to do? My, I'm at a party and my ex-husband and her, his wife, his new wife, just walked out, just walked in. What am I supposed to do? And I don't know why I said it, but I just opened my mouth and I said, oh, well, all you have to do is sing happy birthday to yourself three times and everything will be all right. And she called me up later and she says, oh, that worked. That was perfect. So for some reason, with when I do it, I think I connect it with, you know, ice cream and cake and nice times and things like that. But in a desperate situation, that's the best thing to do. So any song will work, but happy birthday is good. And I wonder if my friends <clears throat> got a ta has a tape of her grandchild laughing and that works for her. So everybody try to think of a mantra yourself. I'll give you a couple of minutes on that. Everybody have one? I'll read you a few. Uh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this, but um, the Tibetans say that the American mantra is, oh bleep, oh bleep, oh bleep, and you can fill in the bleeps, but it's it's true. It's what we always say. You know, not all of us, but you know what I mean. Okay, so the other mantras <clears throat> that um, Rinpoche has uh, recommended was that was then, this is now. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever doesn't happen, doesn't happen. That's a good one. I've resigned from that committee. Not my monkey, not my circus. Uh, what would love do now? That's a really interesting one. You know, that'll give you pause and you have to think about what would love do. So let things be just as they are and love more. Okay, I was in the, um, but, uh, just sort of bopping around in the, um, in the, in the uh, uh, internet the other day. And I heard somebody was talking about meditation. And they said, well, you know, just do what I've said and just remember pain is inevitable, but suffering is an option. And I thought, well, that's somebody who's never gone through chemo, you know? <laughs> and I, the, the, it, meditation isn't a magic bullet that's going to get you for out of the situation you're in, the situation you're in is you have a biological heritage. You know, you're not going to escape old age, sickness, and death. However, you can escape self-induced uh, suffering. And you have to figure out why you suffer and what suffering is and how can you stop making yourself suffer? I mean, you can't stop being a, a human being, but you can do a little bit of thinking about it. And you, you have to know why you suffer. And why you suffer is why is you want the world to be different than it is. So doing enough meditation stabilizes your mind so you can see see things as they are rather than the way you want them to be because you know you want you want to have a long life you have Maldenstroms you don't want to have Waldenstroms you have you're aging you think you're going to be you know 27 forever and you're not 
You want your family to be a certain way. You didn't want your daughter to marry that man, but look what she did. You know, there's just so many things that you suffer about and little things too, little tiny things. Your neighbors, you know, playing music too loud. This is happening, that is happening. They're minute things that you spend your whole day doing. And you don't need to do that. You can do something else with your time. So the, you know, the, the bottom line in terms of Buddhist terms, at least, the, 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 the world as it exists now is impermanent. And it's, it never changes. I mean, change is the only constant and it's always changing and we don't want it to change in a lot of ways especially now. We're in such a world that is going so fast it's hard to even make decisions about what to do and what not to do. So, but the in, impermanence is part of the whole world. And the other part that you have to really make a, pay attention to is that it's all interdependent that the whole world is interdependent. We, and you just think about what happens in terms of a disease. How many things have gone into making just the most simple things like, you know, shots and, and, and all the people it takes to produce the things that we're using. You know, like if you're doing chemo, just the bag it's in, the, the, to the tube that's coming down. That was all created by something. That was all uh, thought about. And even the building you're in, somebody built it. The doctor had to go through the, all these years of medical school. The nurses had, you know. So we're so interdependent, we think we're the ones with Walden Strong. We're the ones that are doing this. We're the ones that's doing that. When in fact, the whole world is involved in what you're doing. And the other thing, and this isn't Buddhist, this is what the therapists say as well, is that uh, you're not the center of the universe. There are billions of, have what, five billion people now? So there are five billion of them and one of you? So how important are you? So quit thinking about yourself so much. And so what they're finding, the, the uh, neurologists are finding, is that um, there's a, a one of the ruts in our mind is the me, me, me rut. They call it something else, the ordinary mind or something like that. But it's it just sees you, it just talks to you all the time. You have this narrative voice that's telling you what you're doing. But in fact, if when you start meditating, you realize there's more to the world than this single channel that there are other people and that there's a world of uh, sympathy that you can in engage in. The uh, Tibetans call it bodhicitta, the uh, uh, enlightened mind. And in fact, it's exactly what my grandmother used to say. And she'd say, oh, Kimberly, don't think so much about yourself. Go do something nice for somebody else and you'll be happy. But it took, uh, you know, a, a, a Tibetan and a red skirt to call it bodhicitta before it really sunk into me that this was a good thing to do. So, okay. Just think about that for a minute. So getting back to the, the, uh, the, the meditation, you can help your meditation through writing. And you can help the med you can do a lot of things with meditation that you can't do with ordinary mind. But you can use your ordinary mind that you use for writing lists, for, you know, doing emails. And we just have this world of emails that we're sort of swimming around in now. But you can use your, your ability to write to concentrate on the insights that you come up with in meditation. 
you can use your um, ability to write to make a list, to make a journal, to make journals that make sense for your life right now. You can keep a medical journal. You can keep a journal of, how, of, great, of gratitude. You can keep a journal for blessings. So there's just any number of uh, types of things you can do with writing. And one of them is to really get into a subject that you're very concerned with. And to me, that's Waldenstrom's. So when I was teaching writing, I would always use this, I mean, I learned to use uh, in the writing classes I taught at UCSB, to use a, a particular sequence of events. One is to take a word, meditate on the word, and then cluster around the word that you just write free, freestyle. You write around, you know, what you, what comes up at, in your mind, and then you do take the next step. So I want to do this with Waldenstrom's for us today. Make that the word. If you don't have Waldenstrom's, put another. Aging would be one, but something that concerns you that you want to really get to the feeling, your basic feeling about, okay? So if you, it, this works better if you have pencil and paper than if you have, um, doing it on a computer, but the computer works too. It's just in the, when you write the word in the piece of paper, you put a circle around it and then you start doing free, free, free form, um, uh, words that go into it, whatever comes in your mind. So, first of all, write the word. And if you don't like writing, just contemplate it. Write a poem. You know, agency, agency, think of agency. But the, the exercise here that I'm trying to get everybody to do is to write about Waldenstrom. So you write Waldenstrom's and now start free f associating and write whatever comes into your mind about it. And it may be cheese, ice cream, something totally not related. And why don't you put a uh, one of the screen things up?
Take about another one minute on that. And then just sit and look at all the words. Look for patterns. Try to find three that go together. Look for font tones. Some have more vibrancy, others are sort of lightweight. And then the last step, and we'll take eight minutes on this, you say to yourself, what I want to write to say about WM is, what I want to say about Baldenstrom's is, and then just let your mind go, let your hand go, your arm go. Just write and see what comes out. Don't edit as you go along. Just and if you come to a point where you feel totally stopped, just write blah, 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 and then start writing again.
Take two more minutes. Now let's just take a few minutes to just be, <laughs> and then Anne, if you don't mind leading us in a little bit of, med of uh, movement, five, eight minutes, something like that. Sure, I would love to, and thank you so much for these exercises. This has been so great for me to learn from you, Kimberly. So if you are ready to come away from your writing, we're going to do a little bit of really gentle, simple movement. So find a way to sit where you're, you feel pretty supported. And maybe you can sit up away from the edge of your chair. And we're just going to kind of get embodied here and bring some awareness to how we're feeling in our bodies. And I like to think about this as if I were an alien life form dropped down into my body, experiencing what is it like to be Anne McMullen today? So <laughs> I'm gonna put that in your mind and see how, you, how that goes for you. So we're gonna start just by painting the area in front of you by lifting the arms up and bringing the hands down. Everything in front of me. I breathe in, my arms rise. I breathe out, my arms come down. I'm feeling my arms moving up as I breathe in. My arms are moving down as I breathe out. This whole area in front of me is my space to be however I want to. And then I'm going to see how it would feel to bring my arms back behind me a little bit and release. So I'm Breathing in and maybe as I do this, I could squeeze the shoulder blades a little bit, lift the heart. So I'm undoing some of that rounded posture that I develop as a result of just being a human being on the planet Earth with so much gravity. Maybe one more painting the area behind you, all of that space behind you is yours too. And then we can 
Go ahead and lift the arms out to the sides, however far up feels good. So I'm floating my arms up as if I had wings and releasing them down. I could breathe in, I could breathe out. All this space to the left of me, to the right of me, this is my space. And I'm in this body, in this space, in this moment with you. Breathing in. Breathing out. Let's take one more like that. All right. And then I'm going to lift my arms up. The space above me, my hands can come down to heart center, that sense of love and connection is right at my heart center. I'm breathing in, lifting my arms out and up. Breathing out in connection with you. Inhaling everything above me is part of my experience at this moment. And we could take one more. Good. And then I'm going to lift one foot up off the earth and stamp it down. Lift the other foot up off the earth and stamp it down. Right, so I'm feeling my connection to the earth, I'm getting my legs moving. And if you're sitting on the earth, you can find a way to do this. Lifting one leg and stamping the foot one at a time on the earth. Everything below me, I'm aware of. And I could take maybe one more on each side. Good. And then we'll just do one more thing here. So bringing lots of space between my legs and I'm taking some circles of the torso. You could do this, Janet, in a wide-legged or a easy seat, whatever feels good. Circling my torso in one direction and then the other. And then I'll just come back to center and stretch everything. Arms, my legs, feeling the boundary of your physical container and then giving yourself a hug for making this time for yourself today to be present and to explore your inner states with us. That's back to you, Kimberly. <sighs> this is a good time to talk about centering prayer. Um, <clears throat> it was a Christian movement started by a Trappist monk called Thomas, uh, Father Thomas Keating. There's an interesting way it got started because um, this is back, I forgot the year exactly, maybe 70s, 80s, back, then, back in the days, they say. And he had a uh, monastery on a road, sort of a rural road in Massachusetts. And it was on the same road as the uh, Insight Meditation Buddhist place was. And so people would come and they'd knock on Father Keating's door and say, oh, we're lost. But they had this glow about them. And he said, well, where, where do you want to go? And he'd find out. And so there were so many of them, and they're mainly hippies, I think, at that point, but they all wanted to learn meditation. And so he started talking to him, and he said, well, what do, what do you mean? We meditate in the, in the uh, Trappist Monastery, but I don't think it's what you're talking about. And so he started uh, getting interested in meditation, and then he came up with a Christian it's, it was, it's not, I don't, I don't want to say it was a Christian version of it because Christians have always had prayer and the Trappists were known for, you know, prayer. But he developed something that he thought would be useful to everybody, not just the Christians, but specifically for the Christians. And it's a method of uh, centering, it's a contemplative prayer 
and it's an inward prayer that it, it, it seeks a direct experience of God. And the way you do it is that you have a, you decide on one word and then you meditate on that. And does that remind you of shamatha meditation? Yeah, exactly. The mechanics of it are very Buddhist, but the content is very Christian and very beautiful and very soft. And there's, it's gotten to be a very popular way. There are a lot of different things online about it. There's a website, a website about it. There are different groups you can join. And Father Keating is now dead. He died, I think, in 2018. I'm not sure. But he has a beautiful voice, and it's so soft, and it's so it embodies so much transmission about what he's He's saying that um, there's one that I especially like, and I listen to it a lot. It's when he's giving a uh, centering prayer to the inmates in Folsom Prison. And his, I'll just read you a little, I copied a little of it out. So forgive me, Father Keating, for my accent. You do it so much better than I do. But this is what he says. Let us begin by closing our eyes and letting go of everything in our immediate environment. We begin our prayer by composing our body. Let them be relaxed and calm. The root of prayer is the interior of silence where we are already one with God and with each other. The deepest prayer is the laying aside of all thoughts and feelings. It is an opening of mind, heart, body, and feeling to open our whole being to the ultimate reality beyond thoughts, words, or feelings. We do not resist them or try to repress them, but accept them just as they are. We go beyond them by effort, but not by effort, but by letting go the world go by. We open our awareness to the ultimate reality that we know by faith is within us, closer than breathing, closer than thinking, closer than consciousness itself. We are totally present now with the whole of our being in openness, in deepest prayer, past and future, and time itself are forgotten. But you are present here in the ultimate reality, like the air we breathe, present within us and all around us, yet not separate from us. We may sense this presence from within, knowing by touching our spirit and embracing it, or carrying it beyond ourselves into pure awareness. We surrender to the attraction of silence, to tranquility and peace. Isn't that beautiful? And just the way he says it is so lovely, so loving for everybody. And there's so much, as I said, so much transmission of goodness and true Christianity in his, uh, in his presentation. So let's just sit for a minute and um, be present. Yeah. So there are many types of meditation. So let's change, uh, change our minds totally from being into thinking and doing because 
it's not enough just to follow your breath and uh, to breathe. You really need to know what you're thinking, how you think, not what you think, but how you think. There's this one story from Milarepa, who's a, I think, 14th, 15th century Tibetan. And he says, we chase after our thoughts the way a dog chases after a bone. We just throw it out and he brings it, brings the stick back and you throw it out, this brings the stick back. Once, twice, a hundred times, the dog does the same thing every single time. Don't be like the dog, be like a lion. When a lot, you throw a stick at a lion, the lion says, who threw that stick? So you only throw one stick at a lion. So when you're throwing a stick at a lion, let's be lions for a minute, and talk about the parts of the brain, the parts of the, uh, the mind that we're dealing with. First of all, we're talking about knowing. We know that this is a lamp sitting beside me. We know that there's a tree outside. That's knowing. Then there's the, the moving mind, the thinking mind, the mind that, um, can ruminate, think about the past, it can plan, it can think about the future. So it's not stuck in the present moment, it just goes everywhere. That's the moving mind. It can have all sort of, they can include imagination in the moving mind. If it was, I was making it up, I would say imagination is one of the most understood develop under, understood least understood and most important things in our whole mind i mean the imagination can create things that aren't there what well, no another no other part can do it and if you look around you everything around you material in the world started with somebody's imagination it, you go outside even the curb you see, you know somebody would be at a, a road and think it would be nice if we got it out of the water and put a little curb up. So everything starts with one little idea someplace and then it exfoliates. One idea leads to another more imagination. So now the, um, the, the th even the therapists put imagination in with the moving mind. The next kind of mind is awareness. And um, awareness is where the rubber really meets the road in terms of meditation. Because once you, uh, if you develop uh, uh, awareness in a particular way, it's like a video camera. It's in the present, it just records what's in front of it, and it doesn't have opinions about it. It's very neutral. It's like the air you breathe. That's another thing why, you know, the breath is so important. It's neutral. Well, awareness is neutral. So you have a smaller version of awareness in focus. And, you know, you can learn to focus anywhere. It's, it's not a Buddhist thing. I learned to focus by being a chef and trying to, you know, uh, get the food right especially on uh, during brunch on you know Saturdays if I got stuck with that I'd have this big pan of uh, poaching eggs and if you ever poach an egg you know it, it just takes two seconds for it to get done and you're out if you're doing 10 at one time you really have to learn to focus so probably all of you learn to focus in some way, you know, probably through your work, through anything. Anyway, everybody has focus, but you're focusing on something. So that's a sort of a dualistic thing. It's you and it. It's, you know, that's, that's awareness. You're focusing on something. But in Buddhist terms, awareness is much bigger than that. And you can take awareness and turn it around and you know, instead of being aware of something, you're aware of awareness. So when you are aware of awareness, you've turned your mind around and looking at your mind. So ask yourself now, I wonder what my next thought will be. What happens? 
You don't know. There's a gap there. And the gap is what's very, very important as you progress in meditation. And medica meditation is a series of steps. It's not just one thing. You know, it's a process. And it keeps pushing you along. So and you, if you ask yourself, who's thinking this thought? Again, it's the gap. So the gap is when you get out of the language, when you get out of the, the busy mind. It's the gap that lets you be, uh, go into being. All right, so you have awareness. And then the final one that I want to talk about is clarity, and it's kind of the light. If you think of it in terms of, you know, a movie, it's the, the light and the projection. And of the, the projector that you creates all this other stuff. And so now what we do is we think the screen is real and we forget about the other stuff. And if you think there's something wrong in the world, you go fake, you know, you go out trying to fix it when really it's the clarity that is the problem of the, sh the, uh, the light has little, you know, dots of mud on it or something. So that's what needs to be clean, not the thing out there. So that's this uh, uh, image that, that people use a lot. But in terms, and also uh, when you, as I say, meditation starts very slow with shamatha meditation, with just minding the, the breath, and then it keeps on through a lot of different stages. And with clarity, the non-dual thing, <clears throat> The, the image that I like about it, and it was uh, Alan Wallace, I, I was his program director for a while. He was a very good teacher, very, very smart man, lots of books. Um, but he would use the image that you're in a barn, you're lying on your back on a pallet, and you can see way up at the top a little sliver of light where the roof doesn't quite meet. The, you know, you get a little bit of light there. And so as you practice, the palette uh, is, is uh, made so it goes up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So as you get closer to the, uh, the roof, you see more and more light. So instead of being this little sliver, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until finally you're out into sky. And the sky is the, and the gap are the same. So you have this, um, I guess, I mean, some people would call it cosmic consciousness or global consciousness, or pristine awareness. There are a lot of different words to go into it. But that's one of the states that the yogis try for, is this skylight awareness. Okay? You can get a taste of it. And a lot of times the... the Taste is what you get at first, and then you'll get a taste, a little taste, and another taste, and then it keeps on, so it keeps building. Um, but we used to do what they called sky, sky, um, sky gazing, and we would just, there were two ways you could do it. you do it in the daytime and lie on your back and have the sun over there, Project your mind into the sky and let it stay there. Okay? It, it's, it gets easier as it goes along. We used to do it at sunset. This is when I was living at Shakti Drampa, the Tibetan retreat center up in Northern California. And uh, we would get together and we'd sit on the side of a hill and just at, at twilight, we would do sky gazing. And it's a wonderful thing to do with a group of people, okay? And speaking of Shakti Gampa and meditation, you're not, you're meditating, meditation isn't, itself isn't the, the, uh, the point. The point is to change your mind, to understand your mind and change your mind. And as you change your mind, you find that you're less um, hard to get along with, for one thing, that you can concentrate better, and you're happier, 
and then you, you look around and you see these poor people and they're so self-absorbed and so concerned with their little petty things that you really start feeling a lot of compassion for them. And so compassion then becomes part of the path. It's not about you anymore, it's about everything, it's about everybody. And this isn't easy because you have to give up being so concerned with yourself. And you know, my, another friend says, oh, you Buddhists, you just love to tell people what's wrong with you. And in a way that's true, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, it was certainly true where I, I lived up there. The llamas were always, you know, sort of needling at you one way or the other. But they also tried to give a, um, you know, a solution to it. But there was this one teacher up there. She, she was really wonderful. It's his name, Lama Sering. And she would, um, she'd come up and she had this technique. Beautiful, beautiful woman. <clears throat> and she'd say, oh... Kimberly, I, I'm so glad to see you. You're just so much fun. You always have something interesting to say. She'd go on and on. And then she'd kind of sigh and look away and roll her eyes and say, oh, oh, if only, you know, and it was always, if only you weren't so, uh, you know, impatient or she had a whole string of things. I'd fall for it every single time, you know. So this is how... A real teacher teaches you. It's not that they sit there and say things to you. They make you realize who you are at that moment. And, you know, maybe you could be improved a little bit. Okay, so that's, that's part of the gap then that you get to. But let's go way, way back just to shamatha meditation, which is the most basic in... in uh, you know, beginning meditation, and it's harder to do, and it's really hard to do if you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it. So, shamatha meditation is simply breathing in, know that you're breathing in, and when you concentrate on that action that your body is taking, is breathing in, you have to, you you not getting your mind, oh, you know, you can't stop breathing, but the way the Japanese say, you invite your uh, thoughts in and let them out on the front door and you let them out the back door, but you don't invite them to tea. So one of the steps is just keep bringing your mind back to what you're doing, which is breathing. And remember I had to have the breathing earlier, I was saying it's part of the... Um, sympathetic nervous system that you can control. So you are controlling this and you learn to control it, but that's just the first step. But I remember I was teaching one time and um, it was a new class and I asked them, you know, how many meditated and about 10 of them did. And I said, well, are you happy with your meditation, you know, practice? And no hands went up whatsoever. And I said, well, what's wrong? I mean, why, why, why not? And they say, well, I think I'm doing it wrong. And I said, well, so and the whole time I'm looking around and I'm thinking, well, is she that? But they are meditating. They're meditating on the fact that they can't meditate. And that is meditation. That is awareness. That's insight when you bring the, 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 uh, the thought back. So... That's the thing that creates a new habit in your mind. And what you need is a habit. Okay. Yeah. And there are a lot of different ways to meditate. Um, there are different breathing exercises you can do. And one um, that Minga Rinpoche... He's this dear, dear man who is, uh, he's a Tibetan, but he knows about uh, Americans and he knows how to t talk to you. So he said, one of the things he says is that you, this is called three breath breathing and you breathe three times through one nostril, three times through another nostril, and then three times straight ahead. 
you can turn that into three, uh, 30 instead of 3. That works even better. Okay. My favorite exercise is being with the body. And uh, I didn't show, show you this earlier because I didn't want to scare you, but what you do when you're being with the body, and let's do it together, okay? Have a little fit. Just start moving and go, 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 move. I want to see some movement here, okay? Just anything you want to do. You stamp your feet, you toss your head, you, you just do this for, you know, oh, God, that feels so good, you know? And so you do that, and then for two minutes, two minutes, I don't know how long that was, but let's just say it was two minutes, and then you just sit there, yeah, you do anything you want, any kind of thing. You, you, you ask yourself, hmm, how are you today? What, what's, your, what do you, what's your emotional life like? What's your, what's your body like? What's happening? And you just make friends with yourself. You just have this little conversation with yourself. And then you go into deep breathing, okay, for either two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, three hours, six days, whatever you want, you know. But that's the start of a meditation. It gets you sort of, uh, besides, you don't feel like you're doing this job. And that was one of the things that people didn't like when they were starting on shamatha meditation. They felt uh, like it was somebody else's system and they had the job to do it and there was no joy in it. and. You know, I'd watch them meditate, and that you did. They would try to meditate, and then <laughs> it's finally over. Well, that's not what meditation's about. It's not being over. It's not getting this thing out of the way that you have to check off like a list. It's a process. So when you're first starting shamatha meditation, it can be very hard. And so, if you don't like it, don't do it. Find some other kind of meditation. You know, just do breathing, being with the body, which I was doing. Uh, you can do belly breathing. You can do meditation. You can do sky gazing. You can do with, you know, with the senses. But one of the best is body scanning. Okay, let's just body scan on our face right now, okay? So take a breath, two, three. Now take your awareness and start concentrating on your forehead. Then your eyes, your nose, just relax it as it goes, like it's a paintbrush. The valleys between your, your, either side of your nose, your lips, your chin, your cheeks, feel every sensation that you touch. Okay? We don't have time to do more than that, but you can do the whole body that way. Another thing is to do the... Um, with your senses. Feel the sensations when you're petting a cat or when you're eat, tasting something, or watching, or hearing, and I want, uh, we'll do hearing, you make, become completely absorbed by the sound. Nothing exists but the sound. And Anne, do we have time for you to do one? I also want to do a loving kindness meditation. We are kind of pushing up against the end of our time. Um, so I guess it would be a, a choice between those two, I think. Or well, um, fine with making mine very short. Can you do it kind of in the background as I do a loving kindness meditation? Yes. 
Yes, let's do let's that. Do that. Okay. Um, so let's just do a little test here of Kimberly's voice and um, let's see, my bowls at the same time. So Kimberly, just say a little something. A little something. Okay, so what I want to do is I, I want to end with a loving kindness meditation which is one of the best meditations in Buddhist Buddhism, I think. Imagine a little a flame in your heart, a soft white light. This is the light of loving kindness. It's your birthright. You've had that all along. So let this light of loving kindness permeate your body. Let it flow through your body, pushing out negativity, confusion, darkness. the loving, your light of loving kindness to all the people on the screen, to all the people with Waldenstroms, to all the doctors who've taken care of us, to the nurses, to the hospitals. Send them the light of loving kindness, a light of gratitude. Send it out into the world. There's so much strife in the world, so much dissension, so much trouble. We're just individuals with our own little tiny bit, but an ocean wave doesn't say, a drop in the ocean doesn't say, I'm just a drop, I can't do anything. It's just part of the, lo part of the ocean. So in that spirit, let's all be part of the loving kindness that's in the world that we can tap into, that we can share, we can increase. And do this whenever you want to, whenever you can, walking around, seeing people in trouble, send them a light of loving kindness. Send yourself the light of loving kindness. Now bring it back into your heart. And feel it again. It's full of gratitude. Thank you all for coming this time. I really appreciate you being here. And may the light of loving kindness become part of your daily routine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, that was beautiful. And I'm curious, um, we are still recording for just a moment longer. If anybody has any questions or things they would like to share, with this beautiful community, you can type them into the chat, or if you're okay with being on camera and being recorded, you can unmute and share with us. And we will have um, a couple minutes additionally to share without that recording. So does anybody have anything they would like to share to 
this group. And, you know, and, uh, I could just say something. All the things I didn't get to today, like journaling and more writing and writing about fear and all of that, is in the PDF that's available to you. So. Yes, the PDF is quite extensive. That two and a half days, she was not kidding. She was not kidding about that. <laughs> so that was wonderful. You're getting some nice comments coming into the chat here. Um, I think that we will wrap this up on the recording and see you soon.